Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight on this, this very important topic about talking to kids about vaping and other substance use. My name is Ronnie Shoa, and I am the Supervisor for Communications and Engagement with WJCC Schools. Alongside me tonight, we have Ms. Elena Trott. She's the Supervisor for Organizational Development and Equity with WJCC Schools, and she will be serving tonight as our moderator. We also have Ms. Jessica Walter, the Director of School Counseling and uh, College and Career Readiness with WJCC Schools. As parents and care caregivers, it is crucial that we have open and honest conversations with our students and children about the dangers of vaping and other substances. Our presenter tonight will share the warning signs from experimental use to addiction and how to have challenging yet life-saving conversations with your children. We have a lot to cover, so I'll pass it over to Ms. Trott, who will introduce our presenter and share more information about what we have planned for you tonight. Thank you, Ronnie, so much. We have a few uh, webinar objectives for this evening, just to kind of give you a heads up as to how we're going to structure our conversation tonight. We have um, five main objectives here. The first will be to conceptualize current trends in use substance use. The second is to explain the effects of vaping and other experimental drugs and how they can become part of a larger cycle of addiction. The third is to identify the dangers of fentanyl and prescription drug misuse. The fourth is to share strategies for talking to youth about peer pressure, experimental use, and substance dependency. And then finally, we will be providing some resources for families in need of additional mental health support. So we're gonna break this up actually into two parts. The first part tonight is going to be the what. So we're gonna talk a lot about um, the drugs themselves that the students are um, maybe experimenting with um, and the effects of those drugs. And then the set, we will pause for a question and answer with our guest presenter. And then the second part of our presentation will be the how. How do we talk to kids? How do we intervene? How do we get them any additional resources that they need? And then we'll have a second Q&A. So just to kind of give you a heads up as to how we're going to uh, structure this tonight. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to meet resource officers, uh, Mike Ferrero, he is our SRO at Jamestown High School. We know that this is a national, um, has, this topic is getting a lot of national attention, um, and so we wanted to really get a better understanding of our local lens in some of the trends that we may be seeing here in the Williamsburg, James City County area. So we're going to start tonight's um, webinar with some a brief uh, perspective from our SRO. Okay, joining me is um, Officer oh. Ferrero from the James City County Police Department. He serves as the school resource officer at Jamestown High School. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, yes ma'am, my pleasure. Awesome. So um, in helping us kind of frame this issue and understanding how it is locally, could you tell us a little bit about um, in your role with the police department, what substance usage trends we're seeing among particularly WJCC stu students in our schools and community? Yes, ma'am. Um, currently, the popular um, choice is the vapes. Um, we in the high schools, especially as well as at the middle school level, um, I have not received any reports at elementary school level, but the high school and middle school level is, um, it's like the, the end thing right now. It's almost like the fad to do it. Um, vapes, although they are under the same code section as nicotine products in the Commonwealth of Virginia, they are easy for the students to get their hands on. The, the majority of them that we are finding are not THC vapes. They're just the flavored um, the flavored vapes, however, we have had some THC ones come through uh, the school division, like I said, at the, up, at the upper level. So um, they are, again, although marijuana has been legalized in Virginia, there are still laws in place that are in line with the tobacco laws. So the age limit and obviously where you can uh, use marijuana products like, you know, the privacy of your own home, not out on the street corner. Um, those are all covered, or the THC pens are covered under those and under the tobacco policy. And then, of course, any drug is still illegal on school grounds, school events, in the school buildings, um, and stuff like that. Okay, wonderful. What about, I know we had some conversation about edibles, too. Is that something that we're seeing? 
we are seeing a little bit of that, nowhere near the number that we're seeing with the vape devices, mm -hmm. um, but the edibles due to, again, the, the ease of obtaining them at the high school level mostly. Um, I do not know off the top of my head of anything at the middle school level and, or at the elementary school level, but um, you know the way that edibles are sold and the packaging they come in to look like Sour Patch Kids or Skittles or um, you know anything that is gonna be attractive to a young person and, and not as easily detected by a parent because a quick glance, the packaging looks just like uh, Sour Patch Kid packaging and then once you look at what is actually written on there, then it'll get into the percentage of THC um, and all the other drugs that are mixed into it. Um, those ones, like I said, it's not as high of a, a number in the schools, but we do see them. Um, we have had some overdose instances in the schools, um, nothing life-threatening, luckily, but like I said, it, it is kind of starting to uh, rear its ugly head a little bit. Okay, thank you for that. Yes. And so to help us understand this very important topic at a much deeper level, mainly from a clinical perspective, um, tonight's presenter, Mr. Salo Ortiz, has been a licensed clinical social worker for over a decade with more than two decades in clinical work. Even so much with so much time in the game, there is never a question. Salo still brings every ounce of his experience, passion, and energy to every day of his work whether it's dealing with mental health issues or substance use issues of all types, the consistent feedback is that he gives all of himself to his clients and his work. And as founder of the Life Change Institute, he is committed to transforming lives to what they were meant to be. Good evening, Mr. Ortiz, and welcome. Good evening, welcome to all our guests um, and thanks for having me on here, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to do this. Great. Well, let's jump in and get started here. I know I'm controlling the uh, the the buttons, so just let me know as we need to progress through the slides. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, it was good to have the officer just kind of lay um, a foundation for what we're facing in schools. I know that Williamsburg, James City County, is not um, is not out of the radar for for the issues that other schools are facing, and so we want to look at teenagers, we want to look at the issues that we're facing and some of the things you guys are, are facing. I definitely welcome questions. And so whether it's during or after, I know that we have a lot of questions and a little bit of time to start unpacking a big topic. So we're going to talk about the fun that is the anatomy of a teenage brain. And if you have a teenager at home, uh, you know that this brain is probably more complete than many. Um, I have a 16 and 14 year old at home, and it scares me to think about um, some of the things that run around in their head. But we can see in this cartoon, while it's funny and we can laugh at some of these things, um, there is no space in there for, you know, uh, rational thought, so to speak, at that age. And we're talking about different grade levels from, you know, high school, we're talking, you know, 14 to 18, you know, middle school, we're talking 12 even. Um, there's a lot that's going on in their brain. And a lot of it is not listen to mom and dad or stay safe at all times. Um, you can see from slamming the door, you know, to trying to figure out your slang because we're, we're uh, you know, Generation Xers or uh, dealing with even the birds and the bees. I mean, there's a lot going on and none of it is about let me stay safe at all times. So we're really dealing with an issue that is not forefront on their minds. Um, they're still developing. There's still space to grow and to move in this, but they're still developing. And it's up to us to try to figure out how to make that work. So if we keep going, you'll see how do we do that? How do we talk about teenagers and understand what's going on? Eric Erickson, not to bore you with the psychology of all this, but Eric Erickson is one of the OGs, if you will, of psychological work. And um, he came up with the eight stages of development. Um, and one of the main stages, you'll see them all listed here in this graphic. Um, there's eight stages and they go all the way from birth to death. Um, but the main stage we're talking about here is identity versus role confusion. And we know this, if we've successfully, semi-successfully navigated our teenhood, um, we are trying to figure out who we are in middle school and high school. And if you have one at home, you know that sometimes they come dressed um, in one way and then the next day you're like, what are you wearing? And what is that on your face? So the idea that we're trying to figure out adolescents and, and they're trying to figure themselves out is huge. Never mind that if there's any sort of de developmental delay whether it's biological or other traumatic experiences, they're trying to successfully navigate what's going on. And if they do, if they make it through, as some of us maybe have, I don't think I have, 
but they have a strong sense of identity. But if there's a failure to do so, they are underdeveloped in their sense of self and they're trying to fit in and they will spend the rest of their life trying to fit in. So it's not so much about just the science of the development of the brain. We already know that it's mush. We already know it's not fully developed, but they have no idea who they are. And so when we have an element like substance use in the schools, when we have something that's readily available, that's all over our social media, all over you know, their schools and their environments, they're just trying to fit in and make it. So we have a big problem because they don't know who they are. We don't know who they are. Nobody knows who they are. And we're trying to figure this thing out together. So I think that's a fair way to, to represent what parenting is. Let's keep going and see. What we're trying to figure out is the terms. What are we dealing with here? Um, there's a lot of terms that change, um, that have been changed around. And as we navigate substance use treatment, there's words that have been taken out. But I want you as a, as a population, as a parenting sort of group and school administration group to understand some of the terms. Use is just the planned ingestion of a substance. It's not, um, it's not synonymous with addiction by any means. There can be a use, and many, many adults know this. We, they may drink on weekends, they may smoke a little here and there, but that is not an addiction. So when we're talking about use, what are we talking about? We're talking about three ways to use. And this is primary to understand um, inhaling, right? Just kind of going through, smoking whatever you need to, and that comes in through your lungs and gets absorbed that way. Um, but it's also what's snorted if it's heavier drugs, right? And just understand that anything that touches mucous membranes is gonna come a lot quicker. Ingesting something, you know, some of the edibles that officer was talking about earlier, some of the things that are eaten, some pills that are taken, it has to go through the digestive system. So that's the slowest way. So we may ingest something at eight, and it doesn't kick in till nine. You know this from some of the breakfasts and some of the caffeine that you drink in the morning. And I know we have the caffeine addicts out there, I'm not asking you to raise your hand yet. I know you're there. Um, but ingesting is the slowest way. Inhaling would be a lot quicker because it touches mucous mem membranes and then intravenously, of course the quickest. Nobody likes it, but if you understand you're chasing something and you wanna get there quicker, intravenous is the way to go because it goes right into the bloodstream. So nobody plans to go into that route. But when we're talking about substance use, we all know and we all fear intravenous drug use, but what about ingesting and what about inhaling? I mean, they're all problems. So I want you to understand use with regards to those three methods of being able to, being able to get high, being able to feel a, an effect. When we talk addiction and substance dependence, this is habitual use. And so addiction is not just a use, but it's a pattern of behavior that surrounds the use of a product. This is for everything from caffeine to nicotine to cocaine, right? The habitual use in, in order to try to uh, obtain a, an altered mindset. Withdrawal then talks about the reaction of not being able to have that. There's a window of time that you feel an effect and then it starts tapering off. And we know this for nicotine, we know this for everything, but that's what withdrawal means. And so when we're talking about the symptomology that we're looking for as parents, you're gonna be looking for the withdrawal symptoms. These are things like stomach aches, irritability, which are common with marijuana and THC use, common with um, nicotine use. There's a huge sense of irritability. Now, remember, we're talking about teenagers here. So they woke up on the wrong side of bed. I don't know that they had a right side of the bed and they're irritable and they skip breakfast and they just don't like you. So it's kind of hard to navigate what the, what the symptoms are, but irritability is a big one. Loss of appetite, restlessness, um, digestive issues. These are all issues that, again, we see in common teenagers, let alone withdrawal from any substance. So just be aware of that as you're trying to ask, what symptoms am I looking for? You're always looking for symptoms of withdrawal because symptoms of being high or being under the influence um, depend on the substance. And we'll get into that later. Let's see some of the other terms you got to know. Tolerance, the amount that's needed to achieve the goal. So we all know we have a tolerance level. Again, if you're a parent, you have a tolerance level for BS or you have a tolerance level for somebody's behavior in your house, right? There's a tolerance to the substance that you're using. And so how much do you need to achieve a desired impact? That's what we're talking about. Cravings then is a desire to alter your mindset. So from craving your vacation to craving the substance to take you somewhere else, that's what we're seeking out. Oftentimes when you're talking to your kids and we're gonna talk later about how to talk to them, we're talking about um, how you desire an altered mindset because you wanna get away from the stress. You wanna get away from the discomfort. There's a craving or a desire for this substance because you know that it's gonna get you there. And then overdose is an unintentional excessive use. 
Nobody goes into it wanting to overdose. Ideally, everybody wants the peak performance, peak amount, but they're still testing everything out. They're still kids. And we know this for adults just as much as we know teenagers. So I wanted you to have the, the terminology so that as you're talking to your young people, you can know what we're talking about. Not every use is an addiction, but every addiction is a use. So we got to know that. And Mr. So, Ortiz, I think yes. this is really important because um, you know, one of the questions that came in in advance um, for the from the registrants was understanding the difference between experimental use to the level of addiction. And so understanding these terms will really help parents to kind of gauge where their child may be in that process. Right. No, that's a great point, Elena. And here's the thing. Everything is experimental use because you're trying to peak out. You're trying to get the top performers of anything you get, right? From, from running your gas with the gas light on, nobody does that, but we're trying to experiment and see just how far we can take it. This is common behavior, but I want to use common examples so that we can understand if everything is experimental until you know ideally what's peak. But if you're in an ever-changing body of a teenager, there is no ideal because it's always changing. The brain and the needs are always changing. Puberty is puberty's an animal, man. And that's something to, that's something in and of itself that we got to talk about, but it's never a peak thing. So it's always going to be experimentation. So Let's talk about this vaping thing. Vaping is tough. We didn't have this as kids. Um, so many of us are wrestling with this idea of vaping. Um, just looking at uh, the pictures we have there, you know, the act of inhaling, it's not smoke. It's a vaporous, watery, you know, it's, it's water, it's vapor. So when this came out, this really changed the game because we all know that cigarettes stink and we don't want the cigarette smell, but vapes are completely different because there is no clinging smell. There is no, it's water. So that's what's really made it difficult. You see the pictures there. This is what we got, right? What is the difference? One is white, one's pink over here, right? But if I painted this pink, it'd be the same thing. You as a parent don't know. And they say, I need to grab my case real quick. And they grab it and go. We don't know. And you see, like, we're not making the pictures up. They're not doing this to try to scare folks. I wanted to show you so you could see that it's very easy to just confuse the two or, or see it and not even understand. But this is how easy it is. So how do we do this? My daughter was telling me this, and so I got to thank her for this. So when I'm holding it here and I'm sitting there in class and I decide to take a little puff and then keep going, and you didn't even know because I was just sitting here, you don't have a clue. And that's what we're dealing with in school. So understanding that the vapor is not going to leave a lasting smell. It consists of an atomizer so that's and then a power source. What are we looking for? Changes in the behavior, like I told you, irritability, all the things I was telling you. But that's how quick and easy it is to use. And that's how quick and easy it is to use in your classrooms. So understand, um, this, is, this is difficult and this is ever changing. What else do they look like? Let's look at some things. What's in it? If we know that teenagers crave sugar, I got a diabetic at home and she lives off of sugar. Go figure that one out. So the flavoring is all sweet. And it all tastes great. You yourself, if you're not, if you're not one that had been smoking or vaping, because we know we adults are doing it too, man, it's it's appealing because it tastes good. It's not like it's gonna taste like you know bird droppings, like it's gonna taste good. So the flavoring is good, the nicotine will grab you, and then there's a lot of the filler. The concerns with it from a teenage development standpoint is the the glycerin and the propylene glycol, like filler, if you will, and what's in that makeup. But it's not all nicotine all the time. Now you can get different levels of nicotine based on the amount, but we know too that the vape is modifiable. So depending on the vape, depends on how you can open it and mess with it. So if you have one with a cartridge that's interchangeable, or if you pop this off and you mess around with it, you can get different flavoring and different amounts in there, or if you hit it longer. So the problem with a cigarette was once a cigarette was gone, it was gone. Problem with a vape is you just keep going. So we don't know how much nicotine they're taking in and, and, and consuming, and you can't monitor it. So for parents who are wondering, how do I monitor it? How do I lower the amounts? It was a good concept to get us off the cigarettes and all the things that, and chemicals that were in cigarettes, but we can't keep up with it. We can't keep up with how much is being consumed. So that's what I wanted you to understand with the, with the flavoring or with the, the liquid that's in there. If we keep going, you'll see something more with this. Um, what a teen saying is in there? They don't know. So 13% don't know. 13% know that it's nicotine, but most of them just know it tastes good. 
Think about your middle schooler, think about your high schooler. And think about the fact that I get to suck on something that's sweet and keeps me awake during class and it just tastes like pina coladas and that's cool because I can't drink a pina colada anyway. And there you have it, right? And so if you just think it's flavoring, you don't really care what else is in there. And only 6% think it's marijuana. And so for the marijuana bakes, they're, they're a little bit different, but if it tastes good, it's all right. And so that's what the teenage brain is dealing with. And so it's not as easy as saying, hey, this is killing you or this is hurting your body because it tastes good and it feels good too. And any of us know that dealing with something that tastes good and feels good, it's gonna be real hard pressed to let it go because it just tastes that good. And the marketing knows that. Let's look at the marketing. We see the different pens that are here. I wanted you to just see some of the different examples and they come in all shapes. Um, you saw one vape, but those, and when it comes to the THC vapes, they have a little, um, a little part of it that has the liquid or the juice in it, if you will, um, that, that you're smoking. Again, it's a waterless vapor. So you don't, you don't know. Um, you see some of the things that are in the car and I wanted that information available to you uh, so that you can have it for later on, but there's just cartridges that you change out. So a cartridge, when you hear your kids talking about a cart, that's what they're talking about. To talk about the pen that you can smoke. And as you heard the officer say, that's still illegal, but how do you find out if they have it or not? Looking at the pencil box here, I'm gonna give you guys a second to point out where the vape is. Cause it took a while and it stumped some of us on the, on the crew here as we were getting this together. We'll help you out. Cause I know it's for the sake of time. Let's go ahead and show them where it is. Um, right there in the middle. So at the quick glance, you don't know. And and I lost it. Maybe it's just because I'm getting old and I lost it with the highlighter. But coloring wise, shape wise, it looks like the highlighting pens that has the multi sides. You know, if, if we got anybody who loves their academics that much, I didn't. But you got those big old highlighters, right? Or it looks like a pen. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with something that is bigger than you and me, big, bigger than even your kid. It's not that your kid meant to hide everything. Maybe they did. You got to talk to them but it's also the marketing the machine that's behind this because this is difficult. It may not be marketed to them, but man, is it hard to, hard to argue that it's not marketed to help us as parents keep them safe. And so I said it. What else are we dealing with when it comes to, to, to THC especially? CBD and Delta-8 are uh, legal. You can buy them in a smoke shop. You can get all those tools. You, get, you see all the little flyers or all the banners out in, the, in traffic as you're driving. CBD is a... Um, is 80% active chemical co compounds of cannabis, right? So that's a lower level. We hear this we, um, prescribed a lot to lower anxiety, to, to relax mood. Delta-8 is the equivalent of THC. Same exact thing, same chemical compounds. It's just one chemical variant off. I didn't do well in chemistry. If you guys struggled in chemistry class like I did, I dropped it ultimately, you're in trouble like I am because I can't tell you the difference. And when it comes up on a urine screen, Delta-8 will pop positive for THC. So, but it's still legal because it's just one compound away. So understanding that it's the same exact thing, same exact impact, same exact um, means of, of consumption. So THC itself comes in two main strands, um, indica and sativa, understanding that there's those two, there's a hybrid, so there's a mix, one brings you up, one brings you down. THC is a depressant. THC as a drug is a depressant. So it's all meant to relax and slow you down, but one gives you a little bit more of a kick, if you can imagine that. So you have to know, at least as parents, what I want us to know is what it is that we're consuming. When we start talking about how to intervene with our kids, part of it is having a real honest conversation because your kid that's smoking to try to fall asleep because of whatever happened to them and they have nightmares at night, it's very real when they're trying to relax. Your kid that smokes to try to stay awake and try to stay active, but they don't want to get on chemical drugs from a psychiatrist is very real too. I want you to have an honest conversation, but this will at least help you see the differences and see that there's a pursuit of, a, of an altered mindset, like I said earlier. So let's check out what quitting looks like. This was from a social, uh, from a social media influencer. Let's check this out real quick. My name is McCall Mirabella, and I am addicted to nicotine. Teen YouTuber McCall Mirabella is going viral after posting about her difficult experience quitting e-cigarettes cold turkey. 
I was seeing more and more stories about kids my age being hospitalized because of lung illnesses due to vaping. The 19 year old says her decision to kick the habit started with a $3,000 bet with a friend at the beginning of the year. If I could make it to December, I was going to donate the money. And I'm doing that because I want to prove that I'm quitting for myself. But she says she never imagined just how hard it would be to let go of her jewel flavored nicotine. This is so I feel like I'm at war in my body. My throat hurts, my head hurts, I'm craving it. When I quit, I was super hungry. I was eating all the time. I was nauseous. I threw up a couple times. I was super emotional and irritable, and I was definitely more anxious. Doctors caution McCall's more severe withdrawal symptoms are uncommon and are urging that stopping e-cigarette use is far healthier than continuing the habit. Cravings, of course, can be triggered by a variety of emotions or visual cues. Withdrawal symptoms do not last forever. You get through them and they go away. Recent studies show roughly one in every nine high schoolers and one in every 35 middle schoolers use e-cigarettes. We've seen studies in humans and in animals that link uh, nicotine exposure to impairments in thinking and cognitive function and also increased impulsivity. Last month, the FDA banning Juul products from store shelves, but that ban on the most popular e-cigarette company temporarily paused. Juul telling ABC News, we do not want any non-nicotine users, especially those underage, to try our products as they exist only to transition adult smokers away from combustible cigarettes. McCall says she is now five months without nicotine. Her message to other teens, despite the pain of quitting, it is worth it. So we saw in that clip, um, it's really important to point out, those of us who are wrestling with the idea, and especially if we never smoked, um, to just stop is not just stopping, or it's just vaping, or it's just cigarettes, or it's just um, THC. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it, especially laying the foundation, the groundwork that we talked about with the developing brain, a developing teenager, and then just trying to figure out how to, how to not do this. How else do we work through a machine when we look at edibles and other consumables that are marketed with them in mind? Like the officer pointed out earlier, I wanted you to see some of the drinks. I wanted you to see some of the, some of the snacks, some of the foods that you see. Um, and this blew my mind. This might shock a lot of you guys. One of the key things to notice on these packages, yes, if you looked closely, you can see some of the words like stony patch instead of sour patch. Um, but one of the things to understand that is that if it has THC in it, you'll see in the lower left of the package, um, I don't even know what shape that is. Let's call it um, an oval uh, that says THC on it and it'll tell you how much is in there. That's the one key thing that you can look for in the packaging, but a lot of the packaging is dead on accurate. Again, to the common eye, to the fast running eye, you, all you see is Doritos, you're just going to think it's Doritos. Um, or your kid when they're sitting in the lunchroom and they're like, yo, let me get that. Because listen, kids are known to share food. I know they're told not to. I know that there's allergies and everybody's concerned about the allergies and the EpiPens. But when your kid wants a, a Sour Patch Kid, they just want a Sour Patch Kid and they love the green ones. So they're just going to take them. So understand that there's there's difficulty or under, having this available. Not that they're looking for this, but what do we have and what are we using and do they know the difference? And then when we look at the drinks, there's a it's hard to differentiate spiked versus hard. You know, if we heard something was spiked, again, we're thinking, mm, don't use that, stay away from that. And we're telling our kids if they're going to a little graduation party or a prom party, stay away from anything spiked. But the spiked one was the one that was not any alcohol in it. It's the hard drink. And we understand there's one spiked one that says alcohol, one spiked one that says doesn't, and then a hard drink. So understand the, the packaging and the marketing is meant to draw in attention. They're doing what they're supposed to. They got to raise business sales. I'm not going to knock them for their business. But for us, how do we navigate this? We have to pay attention. We have to see what's available to them. So that's one idea. And I just want to make sure we saw that. Then we have this, this machine, this beast that's called fentanyl. Fentanyl has changed the drug work and the and the drug usage because um, it's scary. Man, is it scary. The synthetic uh, fentanyl that's being used out there, this is not what you're getting after your surgery. This is the stuff that's coming in from other countries, coming in off the street, uh, 50 to 100 times more potent than, than heroin. 
And there's a fentanyl that's stronger than that. But looking at the amount of how much fentanyl it takes, right? We know the size of a penny, right? We're trying to save some pennies and we see that's just a little bit of the powder that's needed. A pencil tip is all that's needed. Um, and so if your kid has any medical conditions, if your kid is small framed and they take in some of that, they're in trouble. Or they took one pill because they thought it was one thing, but it was really made by something else. And we're seeing a lot, a lot of fake pills being pressed and being marketed and being sold here. Um, I do this drug work and have been doing it here in this area for a while. And most of what's being sold out there is not pure product of what they thought it was. It's all either pure fentanyl or has fentanyl in it. And so I wanted to include some of the things that you'll see. Fentanyl is a, is a depressant. Fentanyl will slow you down or to slow down your heart rate, slow down your breathing. We know this if you've ever had surgery, you know that if you need to take away the pain, right, this will slow down the excitement, if you will. So those kids or those individuals with breathing problems or heart problems, this is a big problem, especially if you didn't know that it was in it. But that's all it takes is, uh, is that little bit of fentanyl. Car fentanyl, just to mention, so that you know, because this is on the streets now, and I've been working with a lot of different task forces, car fentanyl is 100 times stronger than fentanyl. So if you look at fentanyl as 100 times stronger than heroin, and we're already scared of heroin, car fentanyl is 100 times stronger than that one. So this isn't, this isn't a game. Um, the seriousness of this is important to be able to talk to our kids and just say, look, this is what we're dealing with. I know you're still gonna be risk takers. I know you still don't care, or maybe that's not important to you, but at least we know we've had the conversation like the officer said, and we'll say, and we, we've been talking about, we have to talk about the symptoms we see and the danger and the risks because just touching it, just being in the air, there's many officers that have gotten sick. There's many people that have gotten sick. So this is not a, let me run through their bag and see what they have and test out what's in the, what I find in their bag. Please don't, please don't. We need you guys alive too. So, so that's so the importance, yes. I was gonna say, we did um, have that conversation with the officer. If you don't mind, I'll go ahead and um, play that clip yeah, now. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Kind of get that local lens around um, how fentanyl may be showing up in the area. In regards to fentanyl, we hear a lot about that in the news. Um, what warning signs should parents be aware of in regard to fentanyl use or lacing? And have we seen any trends, particularly in this area? So luckily, um, we have not seen anything in the schools with fentanyl. Um, and that's a, that's amazing because fentanyl is something that you you don't want to be messing around with. Um, in the Williamsburg area, just like nationwide, we have seen an uptick in fentanyl use, fentanyl overdoses. Um, officers have been coming in contact with it more frequently. But like I said, luckily, it's staying out of the school buildings. So fentanyl is a, a synthetic opioid. It's approximately 100 times more potent than street-level heroin, um, like, like heroin in its purest form. Um, it's something that isn't very easily detected because it, it can be liquid or powder. And what people have started doing is pressing the powder to look like pills. So what you may think is just another, um, I've seen some that look like multivitamins um, and you know other, an array of pill shapes and sizes, and it's, it's fentanyl. Um, the biggest thing that you're gonna see if your child ingests it is you know severe drowsiness, they're going to be cold and clammy. Um, it will, a lot of times will induce nausea and vomiting, loss of consciousness, consciousness altogether. Um, you know, slow heartbeat, slow breathing, stuff like that. Um, they're just going to seem very out of sorts, and you know, ultimately they're going to go unresponsive if it's not caught, you know, fast enough. Now, unfortunately, if you can picture the uh, a standard pencil, the eraser on that pencil, if you were to take that and trace that circle under a piece of paper, that small amount of fentanyl, if it's pure, is enough that could, you know, kill a full size or a full grown man. So if we're talking about a small frame, you know, let's say high school student, um, lightweight, you know, it's not gonna take a lot. Um, but again, luckily we don't have that in the schools and hopefully um, that's not something that becomes experimental because that is something that very quickly reacts with the body um, and, it, it just, the body just doesn't, can't handle it. Um, and when I say it quickly reacts, um, we've had instances where officers have come in contact with it. And within about 10 or 15 minutes, they're losing consciousness. And we have had officers that had to have their partner use Narcan on them 
to stop the effects of the opioids. So um, now the SROs have Narcan in the schools, the uh, James County police officers all are issued Narcan. So we are prepared for that, you know, but it doesn't always present, sorry, class change. It doesn't always present itself um, like once we get there and we realize, okay, this is what we have going on and we don't have it on us immediately, we have time to go get it and come back. You know, that's always a concern. So the best is if we can just keep it at bay and keep it out of the schools altogether, then that's a win for us, so. Wonderful, thank you. It's, it's reassuring to hear that we haven't had any issues and hopefully with the continued education that we're doing with our students and our community members, we can continue to fight Absolutely. that battle together, awesome. So here's the concerns that we have with fentanyl. Um, I showed you the vape, I showed you the, the vape pens or the THC pens, the dab pens, if you will. The problem with it is opening the cartridge, putting a little fentanyl in it. Um, unfortunately, we're talking about minors who cannot buy THC legally, can't legally go into a smoke shop unless they know a guy. Um, and so they're getting their things illegally, obviously, getting it off the street. And anybody, and when I go to schools, I'm talking about it now in schools down here in, in Southside. You know, I'm telling them, look, if you didn't buy it directly from a, a shop, don't use it because being able to open that cartridge up and put a little fentanyl in it, put a little powder in it, we know that it's addicting, highly addicting. It takes three days to become addicted to opiates is what I've been telling folks, three days for an opiate. So you started it on Monday, by Thursday, you're hooked, your body is hooked. And so you can play around with different doses or whatever, but opening a cartridge on a, on a THC pen or a vape is very easy to grab somebody and now you're more hooked than you thought. Um, and it's also messing with um, how much to put in there. Um, it's, it's dangerous. And so it is more common than we even realize. Um, the fact that we haven't caught it is, again, like I showed you earlier, just because of, um, just because of the fact that things are sneaky. Um, but it's that common and it's in the schools, even down here Southside, we've had a lot of deaths down here. So I want you to understand that it's not as easy as saying, just say no to fentanyl. Um, you know, the, your, your kids and the kids that are buying these cartridges or buying vapes off the street or off of a friend, or off of a guy that knows a guy, um, what I've told kids and what I, and I would encourage you, you can use your own language if you want, but I, anytime your friend tells you, hey, I've got something that hits a little different, or you might like this one, um, when you're 14, that sounds great. You know, when you're 44, that's a little scarier statement, but at 14, you're like, oh, this one hits a little different. Let's see what happens. And that's oftentimes what we've seen. So, those are the problems that we're facing with fentanyl. Um, there's a lot more to be said about it. Uh, we just did not want to overlook it, but we didn't want to um, spend the entire time because it's one variable of the many things that we're dealing with. So what are we talking about with facts? Drug fact-wise, we're looking at this wheel um, and I encourage you to take this, print it out. You don't have to memorize it, but it helps some of us who are just trying to keep up with the times as to what are the categorizations, what are the symptoms, and what are the drugs we're talking about. This wheel does an excellent job of pointing out the type of drugs. When we look at this, the green part of it on the bottom right, um, we look at opiates and opioids and what they act like. You'll see the symptomology there of what to expect, like the officer was saying. And then we'll look at some of the drugs that he's talking about there, from heroin to morphine uh, to fentanyl you'll see some of the ones that you're that we're talking about there. So you can understand what drugs you're talking about. Again, talk to the kids, have this present, know that this is the symptomology you're looking for, but talk to them about what they're using because things are changing constantly. To think that we've gotten up-to-date current um, perspective on this, we're not the ones that are using, we're not 14 year olds in high schools, but this is a good place to start. So please, I encourage you to, to check this out and understand. But you'll also notice, like I was telling you in the beginning, that a lot of the symptoms that you're talking about are gonna be the same for all of them. Anxiety is a common symptom. Euphoria is a common symptom. For, for a lot of these, irritability is a common symptom. So you're not gonna know it just by one symptom. And so please understand, as you're looking at this, that this is just an idea, some, a starting point, if you will, of what's happening with some of the drugs that we're seeing out there. Um, really important to point out, and I'm going to point this out at this point here, um, not part of the slide presentation, but something that parents need to know. Our kids know this already. So parents, if you're thinking about going home and testing your kids and buying a drug screen, you know, a 72 panel drug screen from Amazon because they have a 5% coupon, um, drug screens don't pick up for psychedelics. And so your kids know that. So mushrooms, um, acid, they're not popping on a, on a drug screen. So even to giving them a drug screen at home, 
giving them a drug screen at the most expensive lab, um, not everything's picked up. And so we have to understand this. You have to know what you're doing. So we'll talk more about the interventions, but it's important to know some of the symptoms you see, you're gonna think, okay, I can test for that, or I didn't know that that was in there. It's because you're not gonna pick up everything. So when we talk about the five stage addiction cycle, I want you to understand this again in common terms, um, as parents, as adults, as kids, even if they're watching this, this is the cycle, the typical pattern of behavior when it comes to addiction, not use, but addiction. So this may happen for some use, but addiction especially, there's a fleeting idea. If I talked about caffeine long enough and talked about Starbucks now, even at 640 at night, um, if I say the word enough times, you're starting to think about the closest Starbucks, how many points you got left on your card, can you go get that now? Some of y'all are smiling, I see it, because you're saying, do I need to stay awake for that Frappuccino right now or not? And it starts with an idea. And most of us can quickly push it out because we know that it's close to our bedtime, we're gonna be up all night, and you can push the idea out. But for addiction, the idea lingers. And you start with toying with the fantasy when the idea hits and you start thinking, what would it be like? I wonder how late I would actually stay up with the Frappuccino hit the same at 6.40 PM as it would AM. And you start playing around with these ideas. We do the same with foods. We do the same with um, any sort of behavior that we're in, engaged in. I often talk about my celebrity crushes that I'm not gonna reveal to you tonight. But if I start thinking about that idea long enough, soon enough, it starts turning into stalking. So let's just be real because you go from toying with the idea to making plans. We can all joke about the celebrity crush we have and, and wouldn't it be nice to be whisked off to another country until we start making plans to go see them at their house? That's kind of when we start saying, huh, something's wrong here. And we start thinking, well, you've got a problem because you're stalking. Well, it's the same sort of idea with your substance and your drug of choice because that addiction now starts turning into making plans. It may be like hanging out with somebody, saving up some money, saying, I need lunch money. Um, I got held back after school. Um, can you do this? Or can I get this water bottle here? any sort of planning, even starting a fight at home. So if I start a fight with you, it's not just because I'm a teenager, but I wanna make sure that I get kicked out or that this and this is happening. So you start making plans for the event to happen. When we talk about acting out the addiction, similar to let's say, you know, now my stalking charges that I'm gonna catch from my celebrity crush, acting out the addiction, if I'm gonna catch charges for this, I'm gonna make it count. And so I'm gonna be not just at the door knocking, you know, we're gonna make sure it counts. And this is what we see in all types of behavior that's addictive behavior. If we're gonna use, it's not just a little bit, because we know that the risks and all the consequences that possibly could happen are gonna be huge. So the acting out is where it's dangerous because you're gonna act out to the point that it's worth it. And so from an idea, Starbucks was a great idea, to acting it out, you got seven Frappuccinos at 6.40 at night, <laughs> because if I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna stay up, I might as well really stay up, right? Acting it out is very dangerous when we're talking about the product or the substance. And then the hangover is not just the feeling, it's not just the movie with a Mike Tyson tattoo, the hangover is the guilt and the shame that comes as a result. And the guilt and shame that says, man, how could I fall into that pattern? Especially if there's been a, a period of abstinence, if you will, from the substance. This is a quick reference to what the stages look like and it just keeps going. There's a pattern, a, a low point, you know, the whole, and we talk about it with drinking, right? When you pray to the porcelain God and say, I'll never do that again. Some have been there, some haven't. And then there's a low, and then it starts happening again because holidays are coming up because it's a, a celebratory time with the end of the school year or something. So I want you to be familiar about the pattern and we could talk more about it. You can send me questions later. I would love to dive into this more in detail with you, um, but we have ways to talk through it and some of the interventions, but at least you know the pattern. All right, so this is actually gonna bring us to our first pause break. Um, and so I know Ms. Walter, you've been monitoring the Q&A for us. Anything in particular you think we need to, to address? Not at this time. Okay, if you have questions for Salo about the what, uh, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and we'll catch those. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about the difference between experimentation and addiction. Um, and I think we just should just jump right into the how. Yeah. How do we talk to our kids about these issues? Because as we've learned, uh, they could be very deadly. And this isn't to, to scare anyone, it's so that we can make informed decisions as parents and really educate our kids to um, the realities of these situations. So let's, yeah. let's keep going, shall we? Definitely, let's do that. But here's the thing, when I tell people about telling their story, and I work with a lot of folks in recovery, part of telling the story is what they came through, but I wanna spend the majority of time, and unfortunately we can't do that tonight, but I had to, because we had to lay a foundation, but we wanna spend the majority of time of what we can do that's appropriate, but that's positive. Let's make sure that we take this time. Do not have a conversation of just how dangerous this is to your kids. Talk to them about the how and the 
what we can do to address this and stay on the, on the positive, more appropriate conversation because they already know that there's a lot of risks and you know, we don't have to rehash that. So how do you approach this with your child? Regardless of the age, have a common and regular conversation. Everybody avoids the birds and the bees talk, but we have to have it at some point at home. Everybody avoids the bullying talk or the staying up too late talk, but we have to have a conversation regularly. God forbid your kid is driving, um, you have to talk about the safety issues on the road. So talk often. This should be a normal part of conversation, just like it is about what you have for homework or what you're gonna wear for school, because we have to have a regular conversation. And I want you to, as parents, this is key, Administration is on here tonight for your school district. Let them be the administrators. Let the officers be the officers. You're not a probation officer. You're a parent. You're a mom, dad, cousin, sister, uncle, brother. Be a parent. Be a family member. You are not in charge of having to do the counseling. I know you may want to know the, the answer to why, but that's why some of us have jobs as therapists. We can get you connected and we'll talk about that in a second, but be sure that you're there as a family member, as a parent, and take the parental role. That means the discipline wherever it's necessary, but it's also being able to guide and encourage because that's ultimately what we're doing um, as parents is we're guiding our young kids. They're gonna make mistakes. So be a parent, let the officer be the officer. Let us that are doing the therapy and doing the drug testing and all that do that. Let the administration be the administration for the school. But you be a parent, you be a sister, you be an uncle. Um, and we have to learn together. We don't know anything. We're old and we know that because we're told by our kids that all the time. If anybody's been called a boomer and you know you're not a boomer, I'm telling you, you've been called old in case you didn't know what boomer was. Um, so we have to learn and so do they. There's a lot that we know from experience. There's a lot that they know from being in the moment and in the current situation. So let's educate each other together. Let's be willing to learn together. So anything you offer up for your kid, be willing to say, hey, I'm willing to learn as well or I'm still learning, so teach me. And then connect with trusted professionals that are in your area. Now that COVID has passed, we've made it a lot more accessible to reach out for help. You know, I'm not right there around the corner with you guys, but I'm here. My practice is here. We're available. So reach out to trusted professionals, not just family members, but talk to the officer, talk to the administration, talk to them about who they trust and get connected with somebody because Zoom has made it possible and web-based learning and web-based counseling is possible and know the difference between the teen resources and adult resources. I know your kids may be doing some adult things, but they can't handle everything that comes with it, okay? So do not put on them some of the adult things that you know of, and they will not put on you the teenage things because we're not teenagers anymore. And so we can talk about when we were 15 and we were 16, but we also have to talk about how we're not there anymore, so we're doing things differently. And so teen resources are for the teenagers, adult resources are for them, and you know the difference. There's a different way to do the counseling. There's a different way to have a conversation. You know what to do. I'm not gonna tell you one way or the other. As we keep going, be proactive. Please do not catastrophize every situation. Your kid may be doing something. I'm sorry, I'll tell you that first, but it's not the end of the world. It is something that we can work through. So do not make it the end of their life. To ship them off to boarding school is up to you and the family. I am not gonna tell you to do that just because they have a friend who knows a guy who has an uncle that was vaping. Please do not catastrophize it. Take it for what it is at face value um, and be interactive. If you're asking more than three questions in a row, it's an interrogation. And if you're asking more than three questions in a row, your kid is either gonna get up and leave, they're gonna slam a door, they're gonna do what you saw in the brain there, um, but be interactive. This is not telling them what happened when you were 15 all the time, but it's being interactive and having a conversation, not an interrogation. And we know the difference. So normalizing conversation means that they were doing this when it's not something that's going on the news. You're going to do this on a random Thursday. You're going to talk about this because it's just something that comes up. And just like we check everything else, you normalize it just like you would anything else. Um, the issue that we face with adults and with teenagers is this, the modeling and mixed messaging that we get. Some of us are really wrestling with this. I know that we have more than 20 uh, parents in the school district, but they wrestle with coming to something like this because they do it too. So if you vape, if you grow your own THC, if you enjoy THC because you're over the age of 21, you have to wrestle with that, but you again have to normalize that part of the conversation with your kid. I get that you're an adult and you can drink, you can smoke, you can do those things. You don't even have to wear your seatbelt, I get it. But you have to be willing to have a conversation as to why and recognize some of the rationale that you use may be some of the same rationale that they're using. So at least it's worth a conversation. And if you're not willing to have some of these conversations, 
then maybe we shouldn't engage in some of the behavior. So please be proactive to have the conversation and check your own behavior at, uh, with this as well, because this may be a good challenge for us as well. When we're seeking help, please ask your kid what they need. I know they may say, I don't know. I know they may say, I don't know all night, or we don't care, or this is your problem. But it, the more you involve the kid, the more they feel like they're not a problem that needs to be fixed, but they're addressing a problem that's outside of them that needs to be addressed. Because understand, just like the social influencer there was saying, man, this is harder to quit than I thought. She was wrestling with something that was bigger than her. And now you're looking at this problem of vaping or drug use, and you're involving them and in saying, what it is it that you need? But don't just assume, involve your kid. And help looks different. I run groups for teenagers. I do individual for teenagers. Not everybody needs a therapist. Maybe they just need a parent or they need a best friend or they need a confidant. So your school counselors are a great resource because maybe they didn't need therapy, but they needed the school-based sort of distraction from what's going on in the bathroom or what they're being influenced to do. And they just needed an outlet. So if you ask and you involve your kid for the help, they'll be able to tell you exactly what they need. And you guys could come up with a plan together, but there is not one cookie cutter plan for everybody. And I can tell you that because I've treated a lot of folks. How do we keep going? Some of the resources that we have, because we want to leave time for, for um, question and answer as well. Uh, Meridian Psychotherapy is a practice down here in Virginia Beach, and one of the only ones that do teen treatment. And so safe group that you'll see here in the yellow flyer is support and family encourages. If you have a family member, adult or child, that's dealing with addiction or recovery, and you want to know what your role is in this. Oftentimes, the roles that we're seeing for supports are enablers and codependency. And so what we notice is that we have to address our own codependency or we have to address our own enabling behaviors when we keep giving our kid $50 for allowance. I don't know any 14 year old that needs that. So send it to me, uh, just joking. But we know what we're saying. We don't wanna enable certain behaviors. So this is for the family member to learn their role in the person that's trying to get clean or the person that's still struggling with addiction. It happens once a month. You'll see the information there, it's a paid program. The other program, and this is more intensive for the teenagers. This is high schoolers, uh, 14 to 18, but we're talking about TARP, Teen Addiction and Recovery Program, which was created here at Meridian. I facilitate that group. It's a 12 week group. And the reason I promote it is because there's not a lot of programs for teenagers in our area. What you'll find is, and I do want you to call your insurance or to reach out, but you'll find that oftentimes there's a lot of programs outside of this area. You can address, attend both of these via Zoom. So the telehealth option is there. So being up on in Williamsburg does not, keep you from being able to participate in something in Virginia Beach. It's in the same state and it's accessible. But this is more intensive. A TARP program is a structured, outlined 12-week program for the kids that speaks to them. You got to recognize you may not like some of the things that they talk about, but this is a program for the teenagers, not the adults. Because I told you there's a difference between adult help and teen help. So TARP is for the teenagers. Safe group is for the family members, if you're dealing with that with teenagers or adult family members. All More right, resources then, that you have. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think Ms. Walter's going to share a little bit of, about some of the other resources that are local. So to provide you with just a snapshot of some of our local resources, um, here we have Colonial Behavioral Health, or CBH, as many refer to it, um, Bacon Street, and then uh, Clinical Associates of Tidewater also have has on staff um, a, a couple substance abuse specialists. Um, so they are based in Newport News, um, but they are a resource there as well. So these are resources not just for substance uh, use or abuse or concerns, but mental health overall, or just even some life changes um, that your child might be going through that they might need some extra supports um, outside of uh, their friends and family and, and counselors at school. So um, just as a, a, hat or a, a thought to mention, if you are Looking for more, These are. this is just a snapshot. You can feel free to contact your child's school counselor. We have resources, uh, a couple pages worth that we can share with you as well. Um, and also you can just talk to them if you're seeing concerns uh, about what you're seeing and, and just talk, th talk it through with your, your, your school counselor if you're comfortable with that. Um, but they can absolutely provide you with uh, more lo local resources if you'd like to, to talk to someone else as well. And and I just want to say too, Sal, one thing that's really like hit with me that you were talking about the uh, the you do it to mom thing as a school administrator. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes when we found students in situations where they were in possession or, or even distribution at school of substances, 
you know, when you ask where'd you get it from, uh, it was their mom's prescription drugs, or it was, uh, you know, their mom's vape, and I had mamas coming up to the school to, to get their vapes from their children. Um, um, you know, things like their their alcohol, obviously, is is purchased in, in the family liquor cabinet, those kinds of things. So um, that's hard sometimes. Um, but, you know, and if, if I would just say we, we are um, suggesting, you know, listing these resources with our kids in mind, but sometimes as parents, I think it starts with us, the self-reflection. And if our kids aren't willing to go, maybe we need to go first, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. To kind of get the support that we need in order to be um, have our buckets filled to support our kids. So we'll keep that in mind too, that it's, um, you know, it, it definitely is a, a family approach. I don't know if you want to speak to that or not. Yeah, you know, it's funny because it's just a real, a person, just on a personal note, not everybody needs to get personal on it, but I'll tell you, um, it's been 13 years since I've drank alcohol. I'm not an addict. I'm not in recovery. And I tell that to my peers. I tell that to my kids. It was on a dare when I was running a team program um, 13 years ago. They said, man, you don't know how hard it is. And I said, well, I'll quit if you quit. And that was way younger than um, I think less gray hair, but not any more hair on my head. But now, 13 years later, I recognize the struggle because it's constantly all around us. And they it is something that brought me and my kids, my teenagers that I work with and even my my clients together because they understand that I was willing to do something that was so difficult and I didn't think it was going to be as hard for me as it was for them and they were addicted and they wrestled with this. If you want to know, you know, the, it's the old adage of being able to walk a mile in someone's shoes, walking through this with somebody will give you really, really good insight and whether it's a problem or not is not the issue. It's the choice and the willingness to pursue something different and try it out. So for me, it's been 13 years and I'm proud of that. And I tell people that with pride because I recognize the stigma and the shame that comes with not only the recovery piece, but the mental health issues that are that are not addressed or seemingly not addressed because I have my own concerns as well. And we all have our mental health issues that we seem to want to treat and medicate ourselves. Good point. Thank so, you. Can mm -hmm. I piggyback just on this as well? I think it's also important to remember that um, you know, if you're if you're having these conversations and you're looking at this and um, you're thinking, well, you know, I don't do any of those things, but your child might have friends whose parents do, and they might look at those those parents as, um, you know, a mentor or someone that they really respect, a role model, um, and so they might be seeing it from from people that they feel really close to in other environments, and and it's a very um, similar type conversation or thought that you need to uh, be taken into consideration as as well as um, where else they're they're seeing this behavior from adults Absolutely. or habits. Absolutely. We're going to go ahead and open the Q&A. Um, this is our final Q&A segment. So if you have questions for Salo, he has promised to stay on until we get the last one answered. Um, yep. And while those questions are coming in, I think we will... Um, I'm actually going to skip that piece. I do want to just say we had one last segment from our SRO. I won't play that for the sake of time, but um, he, uh, Officer Ferrero did say in his last segment that parents, if you want to reach out to the school resource officers, they are here to support you, not to lock your kids up, um, but maybe just to have some real conversations with them. Um, he did extend that offer um, to families because they want to partner with you in helping your kids understand the dangers that are presented here, as well as, um, you know, be a, a positive connection in the schools that um, should they be experiencing peer pressure or something like that uh, when your, their family members aren't around, um, that they have a trusted adult that they can go to. So um, did just want to thank him for that and, and all that they're doing um, to be partners with us. And um, Ms. Walter, did you want to uh, talk just a little bit more too about the upcoming event while we've got the Q&As coming in? Sure. So as those come in, just a, a quick plug. Um, we have a uh, another Family Academy coming up on May 17th. Um, this one is on youth mental illness. It's called Hiding in Plain Sight. Hiding in Plain Sight is a documentary. Um, so we will be, we have partnered with uh, the Peninsula Community Health Collaborative uh, to offer this screening. And then there will be a panel discussion um, by those in the field on uh, supporting and recognizing um, you know, youth mental health uh, struggles. And there will also be a, a expo of local resources available um, to either ask questions or pick up flyers on information. Um, it's a, 
it's a short night, but a really valuable night. So um, encourage you to attend if you can. It will not be recorded because it is a documentary, um, but you are required to registration. You can to register, excuse me, and you can even register the day of. So um, the link is available there or on our division website as well, if you would like. Um, also, if you wouldn't mind, while some um, questions are coming in in the chat, you can find a link to a survey. We're always looking for uh, ways to grow in our programming and feedback um, on tonight's webinar with you um, and maybe opportunities for other webinars we can offer in the future for families. So if you could take, it's very short. If you wouldn't mind taking that, that would be great. Um, Salo, a question for you. If, for if conversations around this topic aren't currently normalized in your home, what are some opportunities to bring it up that maybe can feel a little less um, awkward or uncomfortable for both the child and the, and the parent? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that for me, I, I'll give you the craziness that is my brain and my world. Your kids already think you're weird and awkward and dress funny and talk funny and listen to weird music. So play off of that. If they already think you're weird, then just say, hey, we're going to do some weird stuff and we're going to bring it up. Um, but I think that the other part of it that may be OK, just like we do maybe on a Sunday evening and trying to figure out what's up for the week and what tests you have is to, to schedule it. You know, schedule a time to talk and maybe it's your round table discussion. Maybe it's pizza night. Maybe it's whatever. But either a play off of the weirdness that is us because they think we're all old and weird anyway. Um, and so are they. So you can play off of that as well. And you can tell them. What you guys do is weird from your music to your drug use and then play into that conversation, but also scheduling it gives it a time for kids to prepare and know what's coming, not just so that they can be prepared and equipped with answers, but so that you can prepare yourself for a difficult conversation because you may not be ready for the answers you get, but neither may the kid. And so scheduling something is very important. I know that we need that, especially some of us that need the high structure. But I say number one thing is play off the weirdness because all your kids think you're weird. All of them, they're mm -hmm. kids and we're adults. So that's it, there's just a difference there. Play off of that. That's good advice. I think we have, I think you did a fabulous job integrating the registrants questions into your presentation because they're kind of quiet. So mm -hmm. we're gonna we're going to take that as evidence that you did a great job being responsive in preparing the presentation to meet their needs and their interests. Um, you have some wonderful resources available to you. Um, you know, if, if you need to get additional information, we certainly encourage you to reach out to your respective schools um, to get that information. A copy of this recording of this webinar will be posted on our Family Academy channel uh, playlist in our WJCC YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to reference it, perhaps you have a um, your child knows someone um, that is using these substances or experimenting with these substances. We hope that in us posting it to YouTube, that it will be a readily available resource for families as needed. As you need it, um, it will be there, um, you know, to, to phone a friend or whatever you need to do with the information to, to help our kids make good choices. Um, and this really is a community effort. So we thank you for your participation tonight. We hope you have a wonderful evening, Salo. Thank you. You're officially- Thank you guys. I really appreciate you. Yes, and we look forward to some follow-up opportunities with you. I know you've agreed to do some staff training and things like that with us, and, yep. and so we really appreciate that. And send the questions whenever you have them. As you guys get them in at your different schools, um, your different counselors, your principals, um, even you as administration, the SROs, send the questions to me, whether it's from the families, from the kids, or even from your administration. I think this is an ongoing conversation, so thanks for the opportunity, y'all. Great. Everyone have a good evening. Take care.